Good afternoon, everyone. This is the pre-launch news conference for Juno, which will be on its way to Jupiter on Friday morning aboard an Atlas V rocket. And here to talk about the Juno mission and the Atlas launch and our weather forecast for Friday morning is Colleen Hartman, the Assistant Associate Administrator from the Science Mission Directorate at NASA headquarters. Omar Baez, the NASA Launch Director from the Kennedy Space Center. Vernon Thorpe, the Program Manager for NASA Missions from the United Launch Alliance. Jan Chodas, the Juno Project Manager from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Tim Gasparini, the Juno Program Manager from Lockheed Martin Space Systems. And Captain Billy Wizzle, the Launch Weather Officer from the 45th Weather Squadron at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. And we'll begin first with opening comments from Colleen Hartman. Colleen? Thank you, George. We stand today on the edge of a new frontier, and beyond that frontier lies uncharted areas of science and space. NASA created the New Frontiers program in order to allow scientists to investigate those uncharted areas in the solar system. The Juno mission is part of the New Frontiers program, and it has been under development for some years now over many continents. And the most incredible thing about it right now is that it has remained on schedule and within budget. This is a true testament to the management of the program. And I want to personally congratulate Scott Bolton, the principal investigator from Southwest Research Institute, the Jet Propulsion Lab, who's responsible for project management oversight, the Lockheed Martin Corporation that built the spacecraft bus, and many other contributors, including the Goddard Space Flight Center, the Applied Physics Lab, several U.S. University, and a numerous uh, international contributions. And Jan, in a little while, will give you the details about that information. But congratulations to you all. Now, my job here is to tell you a little bit about what we're doing this year in space and earth science at NASA. Earlier this year, we put a spacecraft into orbit around MESSENGER. That's the first spacecraft to ever orbit that planet. We also launched a mission to study sea surface salinity here on Mother Earth and understand that its relationship to the water cycle. We also put into orbit a spacecraft to orbit a main belt asteroid. Again, all of these are complete firsts. The second half of 2011 is no less exciting. We have nearly twin spacecraft which will go to the moon. We have a space, uh, spacecraft which will launch, which will look at weather prediction here on Earth. And last but not least is the Mars Science Laboratory launch in November of this year. And this behemoth has more science capacity on it than anything else we've ever landed on the red planet regolith. It will help us determine whether there was, is, or ever will be, perhaps, microbial life on Mars. So now that we've looked into the future, I want to take your attention to the past. Well, 300 or so years into the past, when Sir Isaac Newton used the first telescope, this newfangled gadget that they had created, high-tech technology, and he peered up at the giant red spot of Jupiter. Afterwards, he wrote, if I have seen further than others, it is because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. Right now, the Juno spacecraft is standing on the shoulders of the Atlas V, and it will be launched into space, into the unknown, because of the creativity of our scientists, because of the tenacity of our engineers, and because of the foresight of the American people who know that we must explore the new frontiers of science and space. Go Atlas, go Juno. Thank you, George. Thank you, Colleen. And now to Omar Baez, the NASA Launch Director from the Kennedy Space Center. Omar. Thank you, George. Uh, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure uh, representing the uh, hundreds of uh, employees of NASA's Launch Services Program and the United Launch Alliance uh, uh, team 
that made this giant that uh, Colleen talked about possible. It, it takes people to do that. Um, these, these rockets are, are started from scratch and, uh, and they're built up here. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, on Friday morning at 1134, you'll see what that giant can lift. Um, uh, let me start with uh, taking you back a little ways. It's, it's the Atlas 551 we're flying. That's a, an, an Atlas 500 series with five solid rocket motors on it. it uh, each of those solid rocket motors weigh about 100,000 pounds. And they each provide about 300,000 pounds of thrust. Uh, that helps us in the first 90 minutes along with the uh, uh, first stage booster to, to get our initial velocity. We're also flying uh, the Centaur upper stage, single engine, which uses uh, liquid hydrogen and uh, uh, liquid oxygen. Um, and we have the five meter fairing uh, to accommodate the uh, Juno spacecraft, which is uh, a pretty large uh, spacecraft if you guys have had an opportunity to see it. Um, if we could roll the, the little uh, videotape that we have of, here's the, um, the uh, booster going up into the, the VIF. The VIF is the uh, vertical integration facility uh, where all the uh, work is done to stack the uh, Atlas V booster onto the uh, mobile launcher platform. Uh, we did this in early June. Uh, we were a little late because uh, the booster had some trouble getting here because of these storms that affected the, uh, the Huntsville and Decatur, Alabama area. Uh, the tornadoes there um, really affected us getting the, the hardware here. So we worked diligently and we worked some weekends and uh, here we are uh, ready to launch uh, this rocket on Friday. These are the, the solid rocket motors going up. Um, there is five of them. It's an unsymmetric set in that uh, uh, they're not mounted symmetrically around the vehicle. Uh, two on one side and three on the other. Um, they're not exactly spaced, um, uh, proportionally spaced, and the vehicle flies just well with it. This is our second flight. Um, Pluto New Horizons was our first flight of this vehicle. It's a rather powerful vehicle for uh, getting to Jupiter. This is the uh, Juno spacecraft within the encapsulated uh, five meter fairing and uh, it's being raised up into the VIF and will be uh, set down on the uh, Centaur. And that's a beautiful shot there and uh, hopefully uh, tomorrow you'll see those doors open to that VIF and uh, we'll be uh, rolling out. That activity is set to start about 8 in the morning. Uh, I'll have a uh, the crew brief and the decision to uh, roll out um, tomorrow morning at about uh, 6.45. Uh, around 8 o'clock we'll start the move. We should be uh, at the uh, top of the pad apron about 10 in the morning. We'll hook up the autocoupler, which is our disconnects uh, to the ground system. We'll power up the vehicle, uh, turn on the uh, air conditioning systems, and uh, make sure we're getting all the uh, right commodities uh, to the uh, spacecraft accommodations and to the uh, compartments within the Atlas. Uh, we'll stand down for the day, uh, start bright and early on Friday morning. Um, we have a, uh, a, a, uh, a weather brief at 8.30 in the morning, and that is uh, what we use to, to make the decision to uh, um, load cryogenics onto the uh, booster on the Atlas. Uh, we'll be loading locks. It's already got its RP-1 fuel on board. And uh, after we're done with that, we do the uh, Centaur hydrogen and uh, oxygen. And at uh, T minus nine minutes, I'll do my last poll. And uh, we should proceed into the count at T minus four on time for an 11.34 in the morning launch. We have uh, approximately 69 minutes of window tomorrow, or Friday. And uh, that's all I have for the brief. Thank you, George. All right, thanks, Omar. And now to Vernon Thorpe, the program manager for NASA missions from United Launch Alliance. Vernon. Hey, thank you, George. Uh, I'm here today on behalf of Michael Gass, our president and CEO, and the 3,700 employees of United Launch Alliance. And ULA is proud to be supporting NASA and the launch of Juno. 
Uh, this will be ULA's eighth launch of the year, and it marks the second of five NASA missions that we're flying this year in the space of six months. Uh, this six-month campaign for NASA is unprecedented, uh, both for its uh, reach across the solar system in terms of the missions that we're launching and in the, the coordination, the tempo, and the precision that uh, all the teams have to execute to manage these overla overlapping launch campaigns. Uh, our teams have worked tremendously hard to get us to this point. Uh, we're all ready to send J Juno on its five-year mission to Jupiter. And uh, as Omar mentioned, we will be using an Atlas V 551 tomorrow. The booster stage of that vehicle is powered by an RD-180 engine provided by RD Amros. The Centaur upper stage uh, will be powered by a single RL-10A engine provided by Pratt & Whitney Rocketdyne. And the five solid rocket boosters that we mentioned previously will be provided or have been provided by Aerojet. I have a, an animation uh, that I'd like to roll now that will show you the sequence of events that we'll experience tomorrow, on Friday. Okay, we're going to target a liftoff at 11.34 a.m. on Friday, local time. We'll lift off with 2.4 million pounds of thrust. That's the total of the SRBs and the, the core. The first main event that you'll see is the burnout and jettison of the SRBs about a minute and a half into flight. The vehicle will be about 24 miles high uh, when that happens. The next major event will be payload fairing jettison roughly three and a half minutes into flight at an altitude of 63 nautical miles. And finally, a minute later, four and a half minutes into flight roughly, we'll deplete the propellants in the booster stage and we'll separate from the Centaur upper stage. At that point, We'll condition the Centaur engine for the first of two engine burns, and we'll light it for the first time. That first Centaur engine burn will last approximately six minutes, and it will place Juno into a low Earth parking orbit. After we shut down the engine for the first time, we'll enter a coast that will last about 33 minutes. And when we get into the right uh, location for the second engine burn, we'll light the engine again. We'll burn for about nine minutes on that second engine burn, and that will put uh, Juno into an interplanetary trajectory. When that second engine burn is complete, we'll orient Juno to the proper uh, attitude for separation. We'll initiate that separation sequence, and Juno is on its way. And as Juno leaves Earth orbit, the Centaur upper stage will do a series of collision and contamination avoidance maneuvers to get it out of the way. Uh, ULA is proud to serve a critical role in delivering these one-of-a-kind NASA science payloads to support the overall global science community. And the mission that you'll see us launch on Friday represents the culmination of years of hard work by both the spacecraft team and the NASA and the ULA launch teams. Uh, we anticipate our Atlas V will perform exceptionally well, and uh, we're looking forward to the science uh, that we get back from Juno to help us learn more about Jupiter and about the evolution of our entire solar system. Back to you, George. Thank you, Bernard. And now to Jan Chodas, the Juno Project Manager from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. Jan? Thank you, George. Uh, I wanted to start off by just letting you know that we had our launch readiness review this morning. Uh, everything went well at that review. Uh, all the systems are ready to proceed with the uh, last two days of our launch campaign and, and uh, are really looking forward to getting off the ground on Friday. I wanted to build a little on what Colleen said about our, our uh, extended Juno team. Could I have the graphic, please? Juno is really a, a national and international team. Uh, Scott Bolton, the principal investigator, comes from Southwest Research Institute, as do the um, Jade and UVS instruments. Um, Jade being the Jovian auroral distributions experiment and UVS the ultraviolet spectrometer. Um, part of UVS was contributed from Belgium and part of the Jade instrument came uh, from France as a contribution. Uh, JPL uh, was um, on board to manage the project. We also contributed part of the um, spacecraft systems, the telecom system, as well as the microwave radiometer. Um, Goddard Space Flight Center is, uh, developed the um, magnetometer with um, a contribution also from uh, Denmark for the advanced stellar compass. We also have instruments coming from uh, University of Iowa, the WAVES instrument. Uh, we have um, Let's see, the um, 
JIRAM instrument contributed from the Italian Space Agency as well as the KA Band Translator, which is part of the Gravity Science Experiment. We also have a JunoCam on board uh, from Malin Space Science Systems, which is an education and public outreach camera. Thank you. I, I, knew I, was, I knew I was forgetting one of the instruments that starts with J. So J is the um, JEDI from Applied Physics Laboratory is the um, Juno Energetic Particle Detector. Um, I'd also like to point out that it's not just the people on the teams that I've mentioned who uh, are part of getting Juno to uh, this point in its life cycle and making us um, being able to be ready for launch, but it's also the families that support all of those folks um, across the Juno team, across the extended Juno team with um, the KSC uh, and ULA uh, partic participations as well. So I, I really wanted to thank and acknowledge um, the contributions of all of the team members as well as the, the family support. Now Vern showed uh, what's going to happen for the uh, rocket. I'd like to show you a little animation that talks about what we do after we separate from the Centaur. Could I have the animation? So here we are lifting off and we quickly end up on the Centaur. Here you see the Centaur um, spinning us up to 1.4 RPM. We separate from the Centaur, about five minutes after separation, we deploy the solar arrays. Um, takes uh, a couple minutes to get those arrays out. We will have acquired our um, signal f over the Canberra Deep Space Network stations by this point in time. We should be left at an attitude that uh, points the solar arrays at the sun. If they are not already pointing at the sun, we will first spin up to our nominal cruise spin rate of about one RPM, and then we will precess the spacecraft to point the arrays at the sun so that we can get sunlight on the solar cells and start recharging the batteries. Uh, we will do a health and status quick look poll about two hours after launch. That'll give us our first indications of the health of the spacecraft. And then uh, three hours after launch, we have a more in-depth survey of all of the spacecraft subsystems to understand uh, how well they're performing. And then um, about six hours after launch, we have a, a comprehensive a rundown of all of the spacecraft subsystems and uh, their health and status. Uh, finally, I'd like to show uh, the trajectory from the Earth uh, to Jupiter because we, uh, we don't go straight on that trajectory. Let me show the anima next animation, please. Here we are launching in August. We go out past the orbit of Mars into the asteroid belt. We have two deep space maneuvers about four days apart. Each burns about 30 minutes. That targets us to come back in by the Earth. We fly by at about a 500 kilometer altitude. Uh, we swing by, that's October 2013. Uh, that swings us out to Jupiter. Um, we have hopefully a quiet cruise to uh, breathe for a minute in between there. And then we come up on our Jupiter approach about a year before um, we arrive. We will start our preparations for the approach campaign, the Jupiter orbit insertion burn, which happens on July 4th, Eastern Daylight Time, 2016. We will go into a 107-day uh, capture orbit. We will do a period reduction maneuver, another burn with our main engine to um, bring our orbit down to about an 11-day elliptical orbit. And then um, we will do a, a couple of setup orbits and then launch into our 30 uh, elliptical, 11-day science orbits to capture our science data. Thanks, Thank George. Thank Jan. Now to Tim Gasparini, the Juno Program Manager from Lockheed Martin Space Systems, the builders of the Juno spacecraft. Tim. Thank you, George. Um, Lockheed Martin is thrilled to have had the opportunity to partner with JPL on the development of the Juno spacecraft. Um, I'd like to summarize for you now some of the processing that we've done in Florida and go over the next few days of spacecraft activity as we get ready for launch. So if you would uh, roll the, uh, the video, please. <coughs> Thanks. Juno was assembled in Denver at our facility there, and we started assembly in April of 2010. And the bus and the high gain were shipped separately on the C-17, and we arrived here on the 8th of April. We transported the spacecraft over to the facility at AstroTech where we integrated it. Uh, once we were at AstroTech, we removed the spacecraft from the shipping container and placed it on the rotation fixture so that we could have access to all parts of the large spacecraft. Uh, one of the first things that we did was uh, remove the high-gate antenna from its shipping container and place it on the spacecraft, and we ran a series of electrical and mechanical tests to make sure that we had properly re reinstalled it to the spacecraft. 
The uh, solar arrays were shipped about three weeks prior to the spacecraft by truck, and they arrived here so that we could do some pre-integration work on them. We checked all of the cells on the spacecraft, and we also installed the thermal blankets and the, some of the harnessing, finished up some of the harnessing on the, on the solar arrays. Uh, we also uh, put them on their large strong backs that we used to install them onto the spacecraft. Uh, each of the arrays is retested after we get them on the spacecraft. Uh, this serves two purposes. Uh, the first is that um, we, by installing and firing a set of test separation nuts, we can check out the uh, pyro system on the spacecraft and make sure that it is properly configured. Um, after the uh, SEP nuts are fired, we uh, will hand deploy the spacecraft and um, verify that the hinge lines and the cabling are performing properly. As you can see, there's a large, the solar arrays are very large. That solar array, the wing one, is 34 feet long. Um, there's a uh, gravity offload fixture that is used to, to support the spacecraft, or to support the solar array. Um, as part of that installation, we also do electrical checkouts, and we illuminate the, sol the uh, solar arrays and block portions of the cells so that we can verify that the solar arrays are properly connected and mated to the spacecraft. Um, after illumination, we, uh, all the arrays are finally uh, stowed for flight, and we fuel the spacecraft, and then we uh, take it over to the, uh, it's on the spin balance uh, fixture right there, and we do a spin test where we determine the mass properties of the spacecraft and compare it to our uh, solid model that we have and make sure that we've got the proper mass properties. After the spin test, we transfer on to the launch vehicle adapter and then go over to the encapsulation area where the ULA has been working on the fairing and we are then encapsulated and ready to go to, uh, to transport out to the pad. We're then um, attached onto the KMAG and we are rolled out to the pad. It takes about four or five hours to get out there and we're stacked on top of the, uh, on top of the Atlas. Where we are today is that the uh, spacecraft has been tested by itself. We've run a series of electrical tests on the spacecraft and uh, it's fine. We've run some integrated tests with the launch vehicle and um, those went very well. We've powered up for the final time and the spacecraft is sitting quiescent waiting for the launch. What will happen between now and then is um, at about two hours and 15 minutes prior to launch, we will open one of our latch valves to prepare the propulsion system uh, for launch. And then we'll do a series of sequence uh, activities where we'll uh, adjust heaters, turn heaters on, and get the spacecraft finally configured for its launch. At nine minutes prior to launch, we'll go on internal power and uh, we will sit and wait for the, uh, hopefully, the uh, launch on Friday of Juno. Uh, thank you. All right, George. thanks, Tim. And now for a look at the weather. <laughs> As Captain, <everybody> starts <laughs> to laugh. <Yeah. laughs> Captain Billy Wizzle, the launch weather officer from 45th Weather Squadron on Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Captain Wizzle. Thank you very much. Uh, again, uh, my name's uh, Billy Weisel here representing the 45th Space Wing, 45th Operations Group, 45th Weather Squadron, and I'm just truly excited to be a part of this team and uh, the mission. I find this mission very interesting. But I want to jump right into uh, the forecast and the official forecast for day of launch activities. Uh, right now we're expecting uh, at uh, T0, we're expecting sky conditions to be scattered 3,000 uh, and scattered 25,000. Uh, visibility unrestricted. Uh, winds are going to be from the southwest, uh, 12 gusts, 16 knots right now. And uh, the uh, only weather that we're expecting in the area is just isolated showers, uh, which we've been seeing for the past several days. Uh, right around Seabreeze onset, we get uh, the chance for showers, but we only expect a 30% chance for uh, any of the weather uh, launch constraint violations at this time. Primary concern for um, violation would be the cumulus cloud rule. Uh, with a 24-hour delay, uh, weather conditions actually get a little bit worse. Uh, we're expecting uh, scattered skies, 3,000, scattered 8, and broken at 25 again. However, we're expecting winds to be out of the uh, northeast, uh, 15 gust 20 knots, with, uh, again, isolated showers and thunderstorms in the area, and we expect a chance for weather to violate the launch uh, weather constraints that's set at 60% uh, for a 24-hour delay. And uh, could you uh, queue up the satellite image? Just wanted to show you uh, right now, as of 11 o'clock this morning, uh, latest telemetry for uh, Tropical Storm Emily uh, placed the 
center of the storm, 125 miles uh, south of Santo Domingo of the Dominican Republic, and or 906 miles uh, southeast of Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Uh, maximum winds with the storm are 45 knots with gust at 55 knots, and present movement is towards the west at 12 knots. However, in the North Atlantic, uh, we have a uh, high pressure ridge and then over the eastern half of the United States we also have another high pressure ridge. Between those two we have a uh, area of troughing which is actually going to steer Tropical Storm Emily up towards the uh, northwest and eventually uh, skirt along the eastern portion of Florida. And right now, the forecast tracks have been pretty consistent uh, from the model runs. Uh, in fact, uh, the last several model runs that they've been running, the tracks have been slowly working their way towards the east. Unfortunately, right now, it's too far out to say with any absolute certainty the exact center and location where the storm is going to be and what the exact intensity and uh, the distance that the uh, strong winds, uh, particularly 50 knot winds, are going to be out from the center of the storm. But right now we are not forecasting for any of those winds to impact us. Uh, on the plus side, anytime you have a tropical system that's in an area, you get an area of subsidence uh, sinking air around the storm, which actually brings you uh, favorable conditions, uh, particularly for a launch. So um, that concludes the bulk of my weather brief. All right, thank you, Captain, and we're ready now to take questions. Uh, please be sure to give your name and affiliation when you get the microphone, and we'll start here in the front with Marcia. Um, Marcia Dunn, Associated Press for Dr. Hartman. Um, this launch is coming so close on the heels of the end of the shuttle program. Could you just sort of, from NASA's perspective, talk about the end of one era, the opening of a new one, perhaps, the new frontier post, you know, pre, you know, post-shuttle and all that lies ahead? Well, uh, the NASA administrator has laid out, I think, a clear plan for the follow-on to the shuttle. Um, my involvement is deeply into space and Earth science, and I think we continue uh, the vein of success we've had. And I believe uh, 2011, the, the list of missions I gave you, um, shows that we still continue an exciting group of missions. Space and Earth science also have a role to play in how humans explore the universe. And so it's important that, in fact, both these sides of the house do well in future, and I believe they will. Jay? Jay Barbary with NBC. Uh, George, what are we going to see on the way up for television on the staging? Are we going to have cameras on board that's going to show us separation? Well, we have two, and I think Vern can answer that. Yes, that's correct. We have two cameras on this vehicle. We have an aft-facing camera on the booster, so we may have an opportunity to see uh, some video, you know, during liftoff. And we also have a forward-facing camera up on Centaur. It's primarily there to observe spacecraft separation, uh, providing that uh, the link margins are strong enough uh, on the uh, Australian tracking stations that will be providing that coverage. Okay. And the second one, uh, what's the difference between this Atlas that you're flying tomorrow than the one put John Glenn in orbit. I'm going back to the balloon. And I see the Lockheed Martin guy smiling here. I'll, uh, I'll take a shot at that one. Uh, well, in, in addition to, uh, what is it, about, about 50 years of experience, uh, <laughs> you, you know, the, the vehicle has a heritage of about 50 years, a little bit more than 50 years now, as you know. Uh, during that time period, the vehicle has continually uh, been improved uh, in terms of reliability, in terms of uh, performance capability. So in some ways it's very similar to the uh, original uh, vehicle, but in, in many ways it's, it's been improved to uh, maintain it as a state-of-the-art vehicle. And uh, I think the phrase was used earlier in the press conference about standing on the shoulders of giants. I know that, that those of us working on the Atlas program today certainly feel that way. There are uh, two generations of uh, incredible uh, engineers and uh, mechanics and technicians uh, that came before us. Uh, the most obvious difference is this rocket is a lot bigger. Uh, we did a walk down on the pad this morning and I was pointing out to uh, a couple of my NASA colleagues that if you took two of the solid rocket boosters on this vehicle and put them side by side, you would have a shape that's about the same size as the vehicle that launched John Glenn. Uh, each one of those SRBs is 70 feet long and 5 feet across, so two of them side by side would be 10 feet across, 70 feet high, and that's approximately the size of those early atlases that we flew. So we're a lot bigger, we're a lot more powerful, uh, we're a lot more reliable, and we're continuing to improve. 
Mercury Atlas was essentially a balloon. It had to be under pressure all the time. Do you still have to keep Atlas, this Atlas you have, under pressure at all times in order to keep it from collapsing? We, we used that stainless steel balloon concept up through the Atlas III vehicles. When we went to Atlas V, we went to a structurally stabilized booster. The Centaur upper stage, however, still uses that thin stainless steel balloon concept. So uh, for the Centaur upper stage, we maintain uh, 5 psi uh, pressure to maintain the structural rigidity of the tank. And we'll also supplement that by always, or almost always, having the vehicle in stretch so that if we ever lose the pressurization, uh, it's still safe. But we no longer have to do that on the Atlas booster itself. Okay, right here. Uh, Leo Enright uh, with Irish Television. Uh, just wondering about the ground track uh, after launch where it takes you, bringing you into nighttime, of course. So I'm wondering, will it be visible to viewers on the ground and will the second uh, Centaur burn uh, be visible in Australia or, or not? Hmm. I'm, I'm not sure we have a good answer for that right now. I, I don't know. Uh, I suppose if you have a powerful enough telescope or if you're uh, looking in the right place, you might be able to see it. We have had previous... Uh, centaurs that you could see, uh, especially if the if the centaur is still in sunlight and uh, even though it's dark on the ground. But if the centaur is in total darkness, <clears throat> it would be tough to see anything. Hi, Angela Swafford with Muy Interesante. I think maybe for Lockheed Martin, uh, with Juno being uh, such an interesting spacecraft in terms of using solar power uh, uh, cells, is this the beginning of a new trend in NASA is it trying to use now solar power for next vehicles? Um, we've used solar power for all of our, um, all of the spacecraft, all the interplanetary spacecraft that we've done for, um, done for, for NASA and for JPL. We've launched a number of spacecraft to Mars with these uh, s similar designs for our solar panels and um, we, c we had the ability on Juno to be able to, um, to use solar cells for the specific uh, mission that we had that we could do on Juno where we were always in sunlight. Um, where we'd have to go back behind the uh, back behind Jupiter and to have an eclipse, um, Jupiter's a big planet and uh, it, we probably wouldn't have been able to do that. But because of the specific mission design that we have on Juno, we're able to do it. Ken? Hi, Ken Kramer for Spaceflight Magazine. Uh, for Vernon Thorpe, I think. Um, can you tell us the differences in this Atlas V compared to New Horizons, which I think was a previous most powerful version? And I'm also wondering about the uh, weather constraints on, on the rollout tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this vehicle is very similar to the one that we used for Pluto New Horizons. Uh, they're both 551s. In fact, uh, Pluto New Horizons was the first Atlas V 551, and this will be the second. So we've flown, uh, you're probably aware we have many different configurations uh, of the Atlas, but this is only the second one that you used all five SRBs. So in that sense, uh, for all practical purposes, it's, it's almost identical to the version we use for Pluto New Horizons. There's minor differences like uh, the size of the access doors and the fairing and, and things like that, but it's essentially the same vehicle. Uh, as far as, uh, could you repeat the question about the weather constraints? Weather constraints for, ro for rollout, what, what are they? You know, you're going to make a decision, I guess you said it uh, uh, sometime tomorrow morning, whether you'll roll it out. You talked about the launch constraint. I'm wondering about the rollout constraint. Yeah, I think uh, th the main thing we'll be focusing on is winds, but I think I'll defer to Omar on that. He's more familiar with it. Okay. For the rollout tomorrow, the, the wind constraint, we're, we're well under the wind constraint. Uh, it's 42 knots. Our main concern right now is if, for example, um, we make an attempt on Friday and have to scrub that attempt and cannot make it in the 69-minute window, and then we have to roll back or reattempt on the next day. That next day, you notice the weather officer says the, the winds are predicted to come up a little bit. Depending on where that storm Emily traces, whether it's a little bit to the west or a little bit to the east, it makes the conditions uh, either better or worse for us. If it stays to the east, that's our most, uh, or, or if it breaks up altogether, that's our best solution. If it comes closer to us, we have a concern um, we don't want to leave the vehicle and the spacecraft exposed um, to, to the winds and, and the rainstorm. Although structurally it can handle it, it's, it's probably not the wise thing to do. So um, one of the things we're looking for tomorrow is to be able to see how far out we can predict what may or may not happen 
unfortunately right now this storm is not cooperating with us in our timelines and uh, it's hard to say what it will be doing tomorrow morning when we need to make that decision so it, that decision may have to be delayed or we might have to take a launch delay um, if, if it doesn't look favorable for us right now it, it, it does look if you if you have a, an optimistic view it looks okay if you have the pessimistic view you might not want to roll out tomorrow because you might be stuck out there and you don't want to do that Thanks. okay yes <clears throat> Stefan Fleden for Italian State Radio and TV. A um, couple of questions concerning the center uh, upper stage. One is uh, how fast is it going to uh, go when it leaves uh, Earth orbit? And how quickly is it going to cross uh, the uh, lunar orbit in the first place? I, I can take a stab at how fast it's going to be going when. Um, uh, when when we're at tip or when we separate and that's approximately 22,000 miles per hour uh, which which is not bad it's not as fast as Pluto New Horizons but um, it's fast uh, I, I can't take a hack at that the lunar orbit though that okay what's gonna what's gonna happen to the uh, centaur stage once it's finished is it gonna go into a solar orbit or fall into the Sun or uh, as Vern said, there's a CCAM maneuver to, to separate it away from uh, from the uh, Juno spacecraft, but but it it's it's also leaving the planet Earth and, and not coming back. Okay. It's it's in a an, an escape velocity. Okay. Okay, Dr. Justin. All right, let's go back here then to um, Todd Halverson over here. Uh, Todd Halverson of Florida today for whoever really wants to feel, field it. Um, this, of course, is going to be the first solar power uh, spacecraft to fly and operate around the outer planets or around an outer planet. Uh, previous missions have uh, used a plutonium uh, electric generator to um, operate. I'm wondering if you can uh, talk about... Um, uh, whether or not this is a shift in NASA's thinking about uh, how it should power its uh, missions to the outer planets. And could you talk about the uh, advances in solar cell technology since, say, uh, Galileo launched uh, way back in 1989? So I think maybe we'll take this in two parts. I'll answer the NASA question. Um, there is no shift in power as technology gets better. We use the best capability for that technology given the particular circumstances of that mission. Um, and so we are always looking for more cost effective, um, assured ways to power our spacecraft. And it is an exciting development that we can actually go all the way out 5 AUs with solar power but there's no need to make a management decision about it. It really is the advance of technology. And I'll let, um, yeah. I'm not exactly sure what the efficiency for Galileo was, but our cells are about 28% efficient. So. Um, just a, a quick follow. You have a launch uh, period here of August 5th through, I believe, the 26th. Uh, when is your next opportunity to uh, launch after that period? Uh, the next opportunity to launch to Jupiter is 13 months later, so it's the September 2012 time frame. All right, we've, uh, okay, Marcia's got a follow-up. Yep, could I have a quick follow-up with Ms. Shotis? What does it take for you to be able to insert on July 4th? How, how do you make that happen, July 4th of uh, next year? Um, or July 1st or August 1st. Oh. <laughs> That's what I, well, why that day in particular? Oh, I mean, I know what day. Well, it was not targeted to be July 4th. Um, it was um, given the celestial mechanics of um, where the planets are aligned in order to follow um, our trajectory and arrive at Jupiter and insert ourselves into yeah. the type of polar um, elliptical orbit that uh, we need for our mission design. So it just falls out of the math. So if you delay a day or two 
does it? It does not change. So we, for this whole period, it'll remain July correct. 4th. Okay, so you didn't have to do anything fancy to, to achieve that day in particular. No, we did not do anything okay. fancy to choose that day, we, and we did not target any specific day. It, it falls out um, of the trajectory analysis. Okay, we've got a few questions on the phone. We're going to take those and then come back here. Um, Claire Moskowitz. Yes, hi, this is Clara Moskowitz with Space.com, and a question I think for Jan or anyone who wants to enter, just wondering um, what kind of overall checkouts do you have to do in the sort of days and weeks following launch, and when do science observations start? Um, I would say that um, we launch the spacecraft, and the first thing we do is um, some engineering uh, confirmations that our engineering subsystems are working properly. Uh, we have uh, our first trajectory correction maneuver targeted for around uh, launch plus 20 days. There's uh, a possibility that we will not need that maneuver depending on how well the launch vehicle injects us into our, um, our path to Jupiter. So we'll be able to make that decision a few days after launch. We'll know whether or not we need to make that correction. Uh, we will start checking out the um, instruments. We call it a low voltage checkout. Uh, we have three instruments that operate at high voltages, but we will check everything out at low voltage first uh, in around the um, launch plus 20 to launch plus 50 time frame. And then uh, we will do the high voltage checkouts um, about launch plus 100 days, roughly. Um, so, so that way we'll ha we will have checked out all of the engineering subsystems and all of the instruments. Um, the official science data gathering, of course, is not until uh, we reach Jupiter and we go into our science orbits there. But there are certainly um, observations that we could take along the way, uh, including um, something that we might be able to do at the Earth flyby. Okay, Bill Harwood. Thank you. Uh, one quick question. I may have missed this earlier, so I apologize. Um, once you guys separate, what is the time frame for... Uh, getting your initial health checks done. In other words, when will we know that the arrays are deployed, that the transmitters are working, uh, all that kind of stuff? Thanks. Uh, we will, uh, in a nominal case, uh, we will uh, be able to acquire over the Canberra stations um, approximately uh, within the first five minutes after separation. Um, we uh, have targeted that so that when we first uh, fire the first pair of solar array SEPNUTs, uh, we want to be able to see that in telemetry. We fire the second pair of SEP nuts uh, six minutes after separation, and then the arrays start to deploy. So ideally, we will have acquired uh, downlink telemetry and be able to see that um, as it happens. Um, there are many reasons why we may not be able to get telemetry, um, both ground and spacecraft and, and, and network uh, issues, but nominally, uh, that's what will happen. <coughs> we will do our first quick look status poll about two hours after launch, so that's about an hour after separation. So we will uh, have gone through and seen the arrays uh, deploy. Uh, we will precess towards the sun if needed. Uh, we will have spun back up after the deployment. Um, we will be uh, turning on our sun sensors and other, instrument, uh, other engineering subsystems, um, just preparing to uh, check out and go on our way. So really, um, I'm looking forward to the launch plus two hour quick look status poll, and then we follow that at, at an hour later with a, a more in-depth uh, summary from each of the subsystems as to their health and status. And I think we have one more on the phone, if you could go ahead. All right, I guess not. All right, we're gonna come back here. Todd? Yeah, Todd Halverson of Florida today again, I think for uh, Omar. Um, how long does it take to roll the Atlas back to the vehicle integration facility if you uh, need to do that for any reason? And what type of weather would prompt you to uh, decide not to roll back? Could you give me a couple of scenarios or uh, conditions that would prompt you not to roll back? I, I guess you're thinking about the weather on Saturday in that case. All right. Um, some of the... It, Depending on the situation I get caught in, for example, if I had if we had loaded cryogenic fuel or cryogenics on board, it takes us about 18 hours uh, to warm that system back up. So I can't move that stack until that process is done. Have I? If I don't do that, I still have to shift in. If if I don't get to a cryo load, I still have to 
bring in the workforce at a certain time the next day to be able to roll back. That rollback uh, can take anywhere from four to uh, six hours, eight hours by the time uh, you're, you're safely back in the barn. So it's, it's, it's a big, it's a, it's a full day. Um, and you gotta take into account um, the local weather then, uh, whether we're in the thunderstorms and so forth where we can't be out there. So um, there, there's a lot of factors into that. Okay, we'll take one last question from Jay. Jay Barbary, NBC again. Jan, uh, you're explaining Juno's mission to Mrs. Russell's eighth grade science class. Mm -hmm. What would you tell them that you hope that Juno will find when it gets there? To summarize to an eighth grade class, I would tell them that Jupiter holds the secrets of, of how our solar system formed. How our solar system formed includes Jupiter itself as well as the Earth and how we got here ourselves. So really the, uh, the spark that I would hope interest, would interest them would be the fact that we can learn more about ourselves by going to Jupiter. All right, that's going to conclude the pre-launch news conference. We're going to pause just long enough to change players on the dais and we will go into the Juno Mission Science Briefing. Thank you very much.